Before we begin our discussion, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this country and recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and culture. We are on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and we pay our respects to elders past and present. Welcome to Sydney Ideas, the University of Sydney's flagship public talks program. I'm Helen Sullivan. I'm a columnist and world news reporter at The Guardian. Um, my column is sort of a profile of a different animal or insect or sometimes an animate object, depending on how mad I'm feeling every fortnight. Um, and I'm very excited to be your host and moderator this evening. Tonight's public discussion is called Oceanic Narratives Interweaving Past, Present and Future. Um, and it's presented by the Sydney Environment Institute. We're going to be delving into the beauty, science and history of the natural world, deep sea and life through time. And we've got three brilliant minds joining us here today. So I'd like to welcome onto the stage Dr. James Bradley OEM, writer, critic and author of Deep Water and an honorary associate of the Sydney Environment Institute. Professor Maria Byrne, Professor of Marine Biology here at the University of Sydney and a world expert on echinoderms. <laughs> and Toshiko King, ocean and climate advocate and proud um, Kulkalag woman from the island of Masig and Baragul of Temu clan in the Torres Straits. Please welcome James, Maria and Tish. All right, James, <laughs> this book, this very thick, beautiful book, with an enormous, vast subject matter is a brilliant achievement. Um, it is absolutely wonderful, and I just want to say that even thinking about taking this on makes me feel dizzy. How, when did you come up with the idea, and then how did you even begin to approach it? Um, so, it's actually a book I've been thinking about for a really long time. I started thinking about it more than 20 years ago. Um, it took me really long, so yes, it's a huge subject, and it took me a really long time to convince myself I was able to write it. I'm sort of actually convinced that I'm able to write it, but um, I, I guess the fact that it sits there means that I did. Um, I, guess, I guess what I wanted to do with it was, it seems to me that we're in a moment in history where there's this kind of convergence of crises and it's very difficult to think about them. I mean, you start trying to wrap your head around what's going on and there's a kind of sense that it's so big and so difficult you can't do anything with it. And, and it seemed to me that the ocean might offer a way of providing a frame of reference that was larger so you could think about some of those questions in ways that they made sense. And, and that's both because I think that, in a sense, Global history is oceanic. Once you look at the oceans, once you look at things from an oceanic perspective, you see things like, you know, this idea that the Anthropocene began in 1945. You know, in fact, no, there's a much deeper history to all of that. You know, it spreads right back. You can see it goes through colonisation, things like that. But also because the ocean is such a model of kind of continuity and connective, con connectivity and, and it really does connect all of us in a really profound and deep way way uh, across time and across species and and it allows you to kind of see connections and correspondences by thinking through it that might not otherwise be available and I also think going back to that first idea that things are overwhelming one of the things we know is that encounters with larger frames of reference actually shift the way we think about things and there's a whole lot of really powerful research showing that people, and Julia Baird in fact talks about this in, in one of her books, but, but that kind of sense that being brought up against things that are larger than yourself and being made to feel small actually makes you feel more connected. Hmm. It makes you feel that you are part of something. You know, it makes you feel more engaged, it makes you make more, it's fascinating, you know, the, 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 that kind of sense of feeling connected makes us behave differently. So it seemed to me that, that thinking that way also might be a kind of route towards, I guess, maybe finding a way to a more mobilised way of approaching these things. I mean, you put it very beautifully. You say, so in a very real, we write, in a very real sense, the ocean is the original hyper-object. Attempting to comprehend its immensity and fluid multipl multiplicity alters us, making it possible to glimpse new continuities and connections. And that's a bit what you were talking about just now, but I'm very curious to know, how did it change you? So you kind of entered this vast thing that somehow, hopefully, you would then be able to use to understand something even vaster. 
um, in, when it comes to climate change. And as you left it again, um, how has it changed you to write this book? I think it's in a couple of ways. I mean, I <laughs> it left me very tired. <laughs> um, uh, um, look, I think that one of the things it did do for me was to give me a sense both of the, an, a much more granular sense of the scale of the crisis that we're in, mm -hmm. but I think it also, in a weird kind of way, made me feel more, I guess hopeful's the wrong word, but more positive about the idea that there are paths through, you know, and they're not going to be, you know, they're going to be difficult paths, but that mm. there are paths through because there have to be paths through, you know, and I guess there's a sense that that largeness of temporal scale makes you realise that, you know, that there's kind of continuities in human society as well. Um, Could you... Yeah. Could you tell us a bit more about the temporal scale that you argue for in the book? So taking, taking the Anthropocene back to pre-industrialization, pre, to, to slavery, really, mm -hmm. um, and why, why that is a helpful way to look at the present. Um, so I think there's a kind of... Many people here, I'm sure, would think this as well, but I mean, I think there is something about that notion of the Anthropocene, where what we do is we kind of construct it as a kind of, you know, and it's in the word, and it's the notion that it's, it's the anthro that's created. It's not the anthro that's created. It's a really specific set of economic systems that have created that. Um, but the kind of sense that it's something that's just kind of happened recently, and it, it, it isn't something that's happened recently. It's got a really deep history going back into that kind of history of, you know, colonialism and extraction and where you see those kind of systems of extraction beginning to appear, and, and you see them beginning to appear in the kind of 1400s. Um, and there you see a kind of shift in human relations with, I guess, with the environment. But, I mean, I, I think that once you see it in that way, once you see that the, you know, the impact, the, 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 change, you know, the, 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 the kind of astonishing stuff about, you know, once the Columbian Exchange starts happening and you see the population of the Americas. So the, the, the population of the Americas at the time that Europeans got there there were about 100 million indigenous Americans, and by the end of that century, there were about 6 million. You know, so that loss of people is so massive that you actually see the climate change. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, so, because the forests come back, and, and that, I, I just think once you start thinking about it in that way, you can see that this is not this thing that's just happened in the last 50 or 60 years. It's something with a 500 year history. And the transatlantic slave routes, of course, yeah, are happening absolutely. over the sea. The sea kind of carried yeah. this, and this, sort of horrors of that were happening out where no one could see them on the sea, hidden in a way and very enormous there, and we kind of don't quite think of... Yeah. The, yeah. Well, and I think, uh, I think that the other thing that becomes really clear once you look from an oceanic perspective is that both slavery and indigenous dispossession are not kind of unfortunate byproducts of the system. They're mm. absolutely fundamental to what's gone on, and you can't back away from them, so... Yeah. Um... I am. Um, I think that a lot of these themes seem to coalesce in one particular chapter, um, which is the Cocos Keeling chapter. It is, it, you know, it's the interconnectedness, um, colonialism, global heating, slavery, and the wonders of the ocean and the abundance and the destruction. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit about what it was like to arrive there and what you saw. I one of the quotes that I thought was very beautiful was, beneath the bush at the, at the edge of the sand, a soccer ball lies half buried in broken shards of cups, or broken shards of cups. It's pale bleached dome like a grotesque parody of a skull or egg, which is a sort of sinister Wilson from Castaway type <laughs> image, but... Um, Wilson gone bad. Yeah, Wilson gone real bad. <laughs> but yeah, what did you see? Um, so the Cocos Islands are uh, an Australian external territory. They are about halfway between Broome and... Sri Lanka, they're about a thousand kilometers from any other land, they're an atoll, they were run essentially as a slave plantation until the 1970s. Um, uh, and they're also uh, very heavily polluted with plastics because they sit in one of the um, currents that sweeps down from Indonesia. And 
I went there with a group of plastic scientists um, and we were doing surveys on some of the beaches. And, you know, so, look, some bits of the island are very beautiful and very pristine, but the beaches that are exposed to the currents are absolutely covered in plastics and, and just garbage. And one in particular, which is one of the beaches that Darwin describes in The Voyage of the Beagles, he was there in 18... I now can't remember, 18... Whenever it was, 20... <laughs> nine? <laughs> um, uh, but... Um, I'm kind of walking along this beach one day and it's just covered in stuff, like stuff. And I thought, I'm going to write a list of all the things I can see. And so I started walking along writing out this list. And it's just like thongs, inner soles, toothbrushes, toys. And that thing where you go, every single thing that I touch, everything that makes up my life, the material business of my life, goes into the waste stream and ends up out here. And it was a kind of really powerful moment about how I guess how utterly implicated we all are in what's going on, I thought. I have, to, I have to say also that a friend of mine who runs an environmental organisation read the book and said, you have to take that out because you're letting the corporations off the hook by saying that. But, you know, it was a very powerful... Take the interconnectedness out? Yeah, well, he thought that, you know, by making it a personal thing, I was allowing the larger forces off the hook. But uh, that, that, pow that personal thing I found really powerful and yeah. quite overwhelming. Well, I wonder, if Tish, if you might be able to speak a bit to the... It strikes me that if you are from an island, you are, it's less easy to live in denial about, for example, the idea that you can throw something away. If you're on an island, you are very well aware that there is no away, I would imagine. <laughs> <coughs> Definitely. And before I begin, I do want to acknowledge country. So um, in my langos, uh, um, I'd like to um, say, Kula ki nalak Namankawi agad, nu maru zapu aimi then alak nampuka poiban, kapa kupu, mitamuka murabuai, a mabagal nu, nuzanel, tish, kukalag, masagnu napa, zendith kesnu, esel. So I'd just like to, uh, um, as a visitor here, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of two of all of your nation and extend those respects to the land, sea, and sky. And so. It's so interesting, you just listing all of those things that you shared, because they are the same things that wash up on our shore. So I come from the Central Island group in uh, called Kukagal Nation in uh, the Torres Strait Islands, from an island called Masig that translates to York Island. We are to um, a Coral Cay Atoll, and in that sort of section of the Torres Straits, um, we sort of can, there's a few connecting currents to that sort of feed through and, you know, our blue highway that brings through uh, things that don't belong. Waste is something very new, like plastic is something very, very new in our society. And so we never, we never had products, everything we used was from the land, like, our plates were from our mecca trees, which are these big, beautiful trees that have more than one purpose of them. They were our plates. We used to cut out our coconut bowls, our, our coconuts so that they were our bowls, and everything that we would use, we would always return back into the land and feed and nurture our island so that it can continue and nurture us. And so with these introduction of these waste and like plastic products it's really contaminated our oceans and it's really it's suffocating our coral reefs where we continue to dive and getting ghost nets and picking them up and it's it's really foreign and I know that it's not the cause of the climate crisis but it's definitely a fucking symptom sorry that was swearing I realize we're recording um, but I think just hearing it's um I think what you were like b building on, like what you were sharing about, like those anthropogenic impacts, and just from that space, is just that we've just shifted the way that we live in relation to, um, you know, the, everything around us, and the way that we are moving in this world is just not working. 
and we need to come back and shift away from this sort of industrial civilization that was so dependent on to an ecological civil civilization that you know is one in harmony um, with our natural environment. Tish, you're very involved in in making that shift happen and also in witnessing the kind of most powerful people who we're relying on to make that shift happen. Could you, you've been to multiple COP conferences, which is something that very few people here can say. I would just, could you paint a picture of what it's like? Does it give you hope? Does it, what's stuck with you? What surprised you? And what's changed from your first one to the, your most recent? Funny, ha ha. <laughs> no, sorry, I have to say that. So, for those folks that don't know, um, the COP conferences are the United Nations uh, Convention of Climate Change uh, conferences where world leaders gather together um, to make efforts in creating a better uh, and just and equitable future for all. Uh, we have activists and storytellers and elders and, you know, businesses that are wanting to shift as well, come together in order to, uh, you know, bring our ideas, bring our voices so that we are inclusive to everyone. My first COP conference was in Glasgow, which was COP26, and for those that may have heard, uh, well, remember we had the Morrison government in. It was after our, you know, we had a really tragic year. We were all going through coming out of the bushfires, and then it was our first year of COVID, and it was our communities and the way that we treated each other were just really different. Um, I was working as the campaign director over at Seed Mob, which is Australia's first and only youth-led uh, First Nations climate group, and I had the fire in my belly. I was ready to, you know, go there, represent my people, represent young people, be there to represent First Nations, and stand together in solidarity, shoulder to shoulder, with other First Nations and Indigenous people globally. Boy, was I naive. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to navigate, uh, you know, politics and structures here, but it was a different ball game. Um, I walked into the uh, pavilions where it's where countries all highlight what they're doing to be more sustainable, and Australia just had their Santos carbon capture pamphlet, nothing else. And it was, I mean, the feeling was from, I think I nearly vomited, I was really sad, I was near, I was with a couple of friends um, that were in, like incredible leaders, like um, for those that know Richie Merzian over at Smart Energy Council, that was, he was just being a powerhouse there, and I was just like, what's happening over there though? <laughs> and I, I actually ended up being in tears because I didn't know how to actually handle, well, it's not even handle, I didn't know even how to respond and dignify a response to that because, well, carbon capture storage is unproven technology. And through all the lessons that we learnt through our, our f the bushfire season, it really amplified the importance of traditional wisdom and knowledge and care for country. We saw a lot of like approaches and holistic approaches of how we manage. And that just looked so far-fetched. And I thought, we're in the year 2020. Okay, I, now I have to remember what year that was. <laughs> 2021? 2021? 2020, I think. If it was yeah, 2020, yeah. Sorry. And... It was, it was actually really, it was a lot. And I was traveling with um, a traditional owner from the Beedaloo Basin, uh, where fracking is currently happening. And we saw billions of public money be invested into fracking as opposed to being directed into our health systems and structures that we really needed at the time. And there was just this really overwhelming feeling. Um, what you know, did you do when you got back? How did you... I mean, what made you go to another conference? Yeah, like, so I think more importantly, it made me understand how 
how much international relations dictate our domestic relations here, oh. and that the way that we campaign and advocate is because of the decisions that are being made overseas, because of, you know, I guess where we are as a country. You know, we are, while we may be in the global south, Australia is considered a global north country yeah. and a part of the G20 countries, which is with China, Russia, Canada, um, you know, big countries like that. And so the whole purpose of them existing is to be able to create financial stability and climate change mitigation and sustainable adaptation. And from there, that Glasgow was just super far removed. Um, but it put the fire in my belly yeah. uh, because right now, sea levels rising are really impacting my island community. And I was also there representing being able to represent my communities and nation where... Um, could, you, could you tell us a bit about how, some specific examples about how it's affecting your community? Yeah, it's um, really interesting when you were just saying, like, walking on the beach and all the things that you could see. I went home in 2020, back to Masig, and walked with my Bala Yase, who, where we actually picked up the bones of one of my grandmas, like seashells on the beach. Yeah. Sea levels rising haven't just been happening in the last decade. Our first exodus of uh, relocating to mainland Australia was back in 19, 1937, uh, when there was a mass exodus of our communities that had to come on. And so something that my communities keep saying to me is that we, we haven't been, you know, this isn't new, we've been living with this forever. We've been living with this since before we were considered people. We've been living with this before there was, you know, world wars. And so this is really confronting. And so, you know, that really galvanised, for those that don't know, um, eight Torres Strait, you know, claimants took their voices to the United Nations Human Rights Committee, to the International Court of Justice, where in September 2022, uh, the courts actually found... Uh, that Australian government was violating the rights of Torres Strait Islander people that actually set precedent for, the, for our uh, Indigenous people globally. And so going back to the COPS is where we, you know, while it wasn't ratified domestically, it's how we stand together with other First Nations people uh, to be, have that Power, you know, have that powerful voice, stand in unity, because together we are strong. And, and it's it, a huge David and Goliath sort of moment. I mean, to think that, you know, just sort of small islands that don't get listened to that much could then make that huge difference is quite incredible. And that from, I mean, you described your kind of naiveness, and that from that naiveness almost came this like, all right, <laughs> well, I also know what's really going on. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, and now that I'm aware of that, it has made me be like, okay, you know, just keep it arms, you know, arms length away from that to, you know, not to wear my heart too much on my sleeve. But I think the biggest thing is that the poli the, last year in COP28 in Dubai, an amazing thing came out, um, which was the, in the first 24 hours, the loss and damage for, uh, fund was operationalized. And how this sort of weaves in, when we won our case, when Torres Strait Islanders won their case, we were the first, Australia is the first developed nation that has to pay loss and damage. The outcome of the loss and damage fund actually is, um, you know, a pin drop in what's required to support people globally. But the biggest thing is that it's only accessible for small island developing nations, which means First Nations people here in this country cannot access it, even if you've won a case oh. against them, that we cannot access it because we are a developed nation. And so where this links in is that Australia has signed up in 2009 UNDRIP, which is the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and so they are obligated to be able to do all that they can to protect their people, but we still continue to see barriers and challenges for that. Yeah. Is there anything anyone in this room should do to help change that? 
I think as we sort of continue on with these conversations, one thing to know if you already don't, Australia um, for, has put in a bid to partner with the Pacific Island nations for COP31. And so I think when we look at this, we need to look at what's happened in the, our political landscape in the last year with First Nations justice, what that means when we work with Pacific Island nations and, their ob and Australia's obligations to supporting what's in their backyard. Hmm. And I think when we look at that, how we come together in unity for everyone. Well said, well said. Um, now, Maria, I would like you to use this bit of time at the beginning of my questions for you to convince the lovely people in this room that sea urchins are great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's a little... That's a, uh, what is um, that a love about them? Uh, sea urchins are really important ecologically, and they're actually vilified. They're called the, the spiny enemy. The spiny enemy. The spiny enemy. Uh, and so unfair. Yes. In <laughs> fact, there's campaigns to Canberra uh, for the Tasmanians because the, the sea urchins have gone south. But in other places, the sea urchins are, 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 are a resource. They're fished. Yeah. They're eaten. So it's a, it's a bit of a balance. And I think Australia is, is out of kilter. <laughs> Absolutely, with the way it's approaching. It's now they're not black or white. Yeah. So we have a New South Wales... Uh, sea urchins, which have been here for hundreds of years, and maybe First Nations people on the South Coast have said that uh, um, the UN people have said that the South Coast, is, the urchins are increasing. That probably um, is right, because climate change, these animals have got, they like it warmer. They certainly didn't want the 13 degree barrier, but as soon as the Tasmania winter started to get warm, happy days. Yeah. So they've all gone south. You can't blame them for that. No. No, that's right, that's a climate change problem. Uh, but at the same time, where, where sea urchins are native, are endemic, uh, Solitary Islands Marine Park, if we didn't have sea urchins in Solitary Islands Marine Park, we wouldn't have corals. Because okay. the, the sea urchins eat the kelp that keep the corals happy. Okay. So there is, again, swings and roundabouts with respect to where animals live within the ecosystem and what they're doing, and the devil is in the detail. Okay. So we won't go into any more detail, I suppose, but, <laughs> but the cl climate change is the, is the elephant in the room here. Yeah. Everything is changing. And sea urchins should not be scapegoated. No. And neither should crown of thorns for no. the same reason. Just because um, they've overfished and we know that these, um, the barrier reef right now is undergoing enormous bleaching. Well, if Could you tell us, you've just come back from yeah. seeing the bleaching. Yeah. Could you tell us a bit about that? I understand you dived with your daughter. Yeah, yeah so, so, so my... Uh, <laughs> is it, well, it's an interesting story. I was going independently for my daughter. She'd be absolutely mortified. But anyway, there you go. Um, <laughs> what are mums there for if not yes, to mortify Well, I was daughters. teaching my students. <laughs> And she was coming up to work with Queens of Parks and Wildlife Service to work with the turtle team. I was teaching my students. And the turtle team said to her, well, the, the turtle nests are four degrees above normal. Uh, they're hatching early, and most and half of these turtle nests are dead, so there won't be anything for you to do when you come up here. Oh, okay. There, she managed to get two nests out of 20. And she said, what can I do? I said, well, you can volunteer at One Tree Island where the University of Sydney has a research station. And so what will you do? Well, you can, there's this terrible bleaching event and no one seems to be recording it. Go out there and tag as many uh, corals as you can. So she did. So, and Could you tell us how do you tag a coral? So what was really important to know, and for my colleagues that are working on how corals die, how they die geologically and by erosion and how reefs get flattened, to actually be able to, uh, to document that, you've got to follow the coral from when it was healthy to when it was bleached and did it recover from that bleaching. So for instance, in 2016, all the corals at One Tree Island recovered because there was a cyclone in Fiji, which meant the corals went across the Southern Barrier Reef and the Southern Barrier Reef was saved from a cyclone that <laughs> hammered Fiji. This year, uh, One Tree Island wasn't so lucky. There was no cyclone. Well, of course, we don't really want a cyclone. But as a result, then the corals started to bleach, and they got paler and paler and paler. We were all up on the reef watching them going paler and paler. And the real trouble is, is that all of a sudden, it wasn't in the news anymore. It's almost like, oh, it's climate change. What can we do about it? Uh, it's almost like people are defeatists. Mm. And I thought, 
we can't be defeatists. This message has to get out there. So I, so I put Ashling, my daughter, on the job, and she had to tag as many corals as possible. Because the important thing about coral bleaching is that there's some corals that bleach, the ones that go fast, the, the, the ones that live fast and die young, <laughs> but regenerate, and the other corals that don't bleach, which tend to be long-lived, grow slowly, and you don't want to lose those because they're 100 years old. Some are 10 years old, some are hundreds of years old. So the really important thing when you see bleaching, is it just the normal species that's the most uh, susceptible to warming? In this case, no. Yeah. So she tagged as many corals as she could in different varieties, and everything was bleaching, even the species that normally don't bleach. So uh, one tree island lagoon, because we have temperature loggers there, was 35 degrees. Wow. In February 2010, it was 35 degrees. In February, I mean, February 2024, it's 25 degrees. February 2010, it was, um, uh, it was 35 in 2024. 2014, it was 10 degrees cooler, and then it bounced around between um, uh, 15 degree, uh, 25 degrees to 28 degrees. That's hot, but when we got to 35 degrees, that's just cooking. So the, obviously the corals couldn't, um, uh, couldn't cope with that. We have got crown of thorns at one tree as well, but if there's no corals, there's no crown of thorns. So that might solve that one, you know, but it's a terrible way, it's a terrible state of affairs at the and moment. You, and like, you make a really incredible point. Like, we're now in a state where our oceans are just it, like absorbing so much, like so much heat and that it's really impacting our coral reef structures and people like, uh, like mine and Musig, we're really dependent mm -hmm. on our coral reef structures because it provides our food. It's also our first when we're seeing more natural events like cyclones happen harder and faster and frequently. You know, during that monsoonal season, we, it impacts our food security. It impacts our health where, you know, dengue fever and sort of like all of these uh, like diseases come through from the tropics. And so it becomes, it's like a health issue. And so when we were hearing this, it's like, and that they're going more polewards, it's actually quite scary and frightening. Yeah. 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 It is, and, and it's, it is a, as James said in the book, with respect to shifting baselines, you can go back to the colonial days when North America was populated by indigenous people. Yes, climate change isn't, isn't the only shifting baseline here. Mm. Uh, so fossil fuels is one thing, but there's been an enormous experiment with the planet Earth, which has been all very negative. Uh, that's gone through all the uh, changes in deforestation, uh, the, 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 the palm oil plantations, the, the decimation of biodiversity, and the overfishing of cod in the North Atlantic. I mean, who thought you could walk across from, new, from the Maritimes in Canada to Greenland on the backs of cod? And so that's not just climate change. These, these oceans have been messed with for a very, very long time. And the Barrier Reef, there's the, the, um, and in Australian waters, and, it's, it's, and, and off Sydney, we have top, there's, it's overfishing. And the, it's the, it, that's the other thing that's the elephant in the room. You know, you've got the, the lobbies of the shooters and the fishers, and I fish and I vote. And it's just like, it's not, yes, you can fish and you can vote, but do you want fish for your future children? So everything is contributing to the upset of the balance. So crown of thorns is probably overfishing is the main reason why we've got too many cots. And, and now we've got something, you've got these, you, they often say the only thing that's going to be left on the planet after nuclear war will be the cockroaches. Well, listen, <laughs> you wonder about what's going to be left in the worth, world after all this. It doesn't have to be a nuclear bomb that goes off. We're already decimating a lot of our natural world. So you'll have species that are really, really resilient. They might not be the species that will feed the planet, though, but they will do quite well. Mm. Is that, um, so for example, sea urchins or crown of thorns, how are they, are they evolving to adapt to? They, well, they've, well, they're not evolving. They've been around for millions of years, so they're evolved. They're evolved. But, but, but they're incredibly plastic. Okay. They can suit the situation. They can, if they, if they can, if there's, there's lots to eat, they'll get bigger. Okay. It's great like having a diet pill. If there's not <laughs> enough to eat, they have to shrink. And they'll hang out for another 10 years, wait till <laughs> more food comes back. There's more coral, yippee, I'll grow again, and then I'll shrink. I mean, there's not many animals on the planet that can do that sort of thing. But yeah. some of these echinoderms are incredibly plastic and they can suit the situation and, w and hang out. 
and well, the corals are dead or other animals are dead, and that's not, um, that's natural. Yeah. But they've always been like that, and they've, they've filled a niche in, in the planet as well, in the marine life, but now other things are gone, like their predators are gone. Yeah. That would have kept them in check. Uh, and there's just that massive loss of abundance as mm -hmm. well, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, there's amazing stories when you read the historical accounts of how many fish there were, particularly in the sea. There's an amazing account about when they, when people were first, when Europeans were first going to the Caribbean, there's huge fields of seagrass around some of the islands, and they could navigate in, in the darkness, for like the last 20 miles by listening to the sound of the turtles that were feeding, kind of clucking together, because there were so many turtles there. Like, you know, there were just, you know, millions of turtles kind of feeding there, and they're all gone. Mm. And I, it just makes me think about, like, exact, like, the stories of the past and the lessons of the past and how we can learn from them and to make decisions today for a better tomorrow. There's a constellation we call bite arm, which is the shark, that when its nose hits the tip of our horizon, we know when the fruit will... Uh, uh, when a tree will fruit, and then we know that we can catch fish from an ocean. And I think, like, that's our traditional knowledge in science, but translating that to Western science, our sky and our ocean are a coupled system. Mm. We work so in sync. And so there are real lessons that we can really implement into the way that we moved for this because and, and learn from it and how, yeah, what we can do, but we're now at a point where the seasonal cues of what we could see naturally aren't in season anymore, and our ad adaptation measures that we could work uh, because of pollution and, that, uh, and the changes, it's really hard to use traditional knowledge in, and weave that back into our practices, mm -hmm. and that's something that is coming from what you said, that you know, we've got extractivism from our land and our oceans that is polluting our sky, and it's just not balanced. And everything from whales, as you write about so beautifully, their songs, but uh, you know, they're being impacted by sound in the ocean, to krill, which you, I did not know about krill, but krill, which you can see from space, the swarms, they're so big, are being hugely impacted by overfishing and climate change. Yeah, so the, so the, I mean, in fact, what we were just talking about was, so the krill, the krill have a really specific and quite complex life cycle, and they are the absolute foundation of the Antarctic, many of you will know this, but they're the foundation of the Antarctic ecosystem. Everything eats the krill, basically. Um, and it's, their life cycle is kind of tuned to the movement of the sea ice and to the flowering of the phytoplankton that you get down there as the sea ice kind of retreats. And that's all coming out of whack at the moment. You know, the sea ice regime has gone through a phase shift in the last couple of years. It's no longer behaving how it used to. No one quite knows what's going to happen to it, but there'll be a lot less of it. Um, but you also have them now being fished really hard. And, you know, that the fishing is kind of managed. There's an organisation which is supposed to be in charge of it, but they've, like lots of these organisations, they can't actually get their act together to do a number of the things they need to do. But as always with fishing, they're saying, well, here are these rules saying this is how much you can catch. And of course, these ships go down there and they catch much more than that. Oh, whoops, we've doubled our catch over what it was supposed to be, but we'll stop now. They're catching, there's bycatch, so they're killing whales and things at the same time. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's, it's the thing about these kind of, this incredibly important animal, which has these multiple pressures coming to bear on it at once, you know, and, I mean, you know, there's a lot of krill, they're not going to disappear tomorrow, they're reasonably adaptable and intelligent animals in lots of ways, but, you know, they are under a big pressure, and, you know, you talk to the scientists and they say, look, if it changes, it could change very, very fast, yeah. you know, and if it changes, you know, if salps replace the krill, um, that's everything, you know, but I mean, emperor penguins are done by yeah. the sound of it. It sounds like emperor penguins are just gone with yeah. the change in the sea ice. There won't be any more emperor penguins yeah. by the end of the century. And I was you there know. last year, uh, and it's like, e like, it's actually really crazy how under threat our polar mm. ecosystems are. Mm. And you're right, like that is the start of our food webs that has so many cascading impacts. And we're talking about oceans. You know, there are song lines that connect us all down there. Like, you know, that c connectivity and continuity of the oceans, why it's so important. And 
even their landforms, like there's algae growing on top of ice because it's warming up there. So, talking about polewoods, like there is uh, seawater coming under the, like, you know, the landmass of Antarctica that's eroding from the inside. And so I saw like these ice sheets fall down, which is what's creating, you know, sea levels to rise. And this is all happening because our planet is warming. Yeah. We've, we've got a, a phenomenon called polar amplification. And this is where a scientist really got quite a shock because the models, we understood that the, the, the sea ice understood how, to some extent, how the poles were acidifying and warming. But the thing about the poles is the sh ice sheets, the sea ice, reflects the heat back to, the, to, uh, to space. And that kept the, kept, keeps the, the poles cooler. As soon as that ice is gone, you now have a situation where the ice is no longer bouncing the heat back. The sea is now taking it because the sea is there. And so this polar amplification has surprised the hell out of scientists. The, end, the poles are warming so fast now because that libido, that, that, that um, bouncing back of heat is now uh, reduced significantly. The Arctic is probably going to be ice-free by 2030. Arctic, not, the, not Antarctica. The Arctic is the one that's in worse shape. Antarctica has been hard because it's isolated by the circumpolar current, has been somewhat sheltered. But again, like, like Tish says, the, the ice is melting from underneath. And that was another uh, aspect of the change in Antarctica that scientists were not cognizant of because it was happening underneath and not from the surface. So between the, the lack of the, the, the heat going back into space and melting from the underneath, and it's, we really, really are in uncertain times with respect to Antarctica. The Arctic is there, a lot of eyes on it, and it's, at, it's attached to continents, like the North, of, the North Pacific and the North Atlantic parts of the Arctic are, to, are associated with the European continent and the Asian continent. The um, Antarctica has been on its own, and so they thought it was sort of buffered, but it's, it's now changing so fast. And talk about the krill, um, the krill depend on their larval stages, are so clever, so clever. They've so evolved to use the, sea, the, the algae under the sea ice. And those are the babies. So if the sea ice is gone, there'll be no algae for those babies krill to eat. So the, the, the population will, will start crashing. Yeah, I mean, their life cycle is tied to the movement of the ice. Yeah. Really, mm -hmm. that kind of heartbeat of the ice going in and out is what the krill kind of live on. But I mean, even in the time I've been writing this book, so in the 2019, perhaps when I was first working seriously on it, you know, East Antarctica, everyone was clear. So there's kind of two bits to Antarctica. There's the, the west, which sits in, which is kind of sitting in the water in a basin of water. And that's the bit that, you know, we know melt, melted in the last glacial. Um, and there's East Antarctica, which actually has most of the ice, but is up on land. So it's kind of, and, and, and so even four or five years ago, people were quite clear that East Antarctica wasn't going to melt, yeah. it's going to be okay. And in the time it's taken me to write this book, we've moved to East Antarctica is destabilizing and melting. Mm. Like, you know, I mean, it's, it, is hap it is happening so fast and yeah. things are changing so incredibly fast. I mean, one of the things I write about in the book is that one of the things we didn't know was whether, whether West Antarctica melted in the last interglacial. So whether the last time there was a warm period like this and there was much higher sea levels, that was because of West Antarctica. And a group of scientists, Australian scientists in fact mostly, um, did a, a, a talk about the book, but essentially they looked at a series of studies about iceberg um, deposits on the bottom of the sea. And what became really clear is that, yeah, West Antarctica did melt, it melted entirely using these various lines of evidence. Um, and what they also found was that it wasn't like the planet warmed up and the ice slowly melted. It's like the planet warmed up a bit and the whole thing went. Yeah. And it's quite clear that there's a series of tipping points where basically you hit, and, and these scientists say, well, we are past that tipping point. You know, West Antarctica is melting, you know, and once it goes into that phase, it will continue melting. Now, the one, the one glimmer of good news in that is that they said these tipping points seem to be like that, so you'll get massive ice loss for maybe six or seven hundred years and then it will slow down for a little while. Um, but, you know, which weirdly, I mean, that might mean the difference between over the next six or seven hundred years, sea levels going up ten metres and going up twenty. You know, like, I yeah. mean, it is kind of, it's, it's not an insignificant, an insignificant thing. But, yeah, I mean, it's, 
Yeah, I found, I mean, so you asked what changed while I was writing the book. I actually found writing the Antarctic stuff really... There's something about taking on board how much of the stuff around sea level rise and that collapse is now completely unstoppable mm -hmm. and within our lifetimes. You know, like it's just, you know, and it's quite... Like you kind of, like, like you, just, you kind of bounce off it. Like you kind of go, oh, I understand it. And then it's like, gosh, I can't even hold that in my head. You know? Yeah, kind of albedo effective. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop. Yeah. But yeah. the one thing I thought was really interesting is almost every single scientist I spoke to, when you turn the mic, you know, when you turn the thing off, they'll say the really big thing is sea level rise. Like one after another, mm. like with their coral scientists, like they're all like, it's all sea level rise. They're all obsessed with sea level rise, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting because it's one of those things that's not actually discussed very much, you know? And it's my relived reality. Yeah, well, it's yeah. your lived reality. Where my community, I just got back from the Torres Straits and they've asked us to relocate. And I think that is something that we need to reflect on mm. because my communities don't even contribute to our global emissions, yet we're on the front lines of being impacted first and worst. And we know what we need to do. We need to keep out, we need to stop our planet from warming. Mm. And that's keeping on fossil fuels in the ground. Mm. I think that's a really good and important note to stop on and to ask if there are any questions from the audience. Um, thank you. <laughs> and thank you, all of you. Do we have questions? Oh, yeah. And I'll have a look at Slido in the meantime. Thank you. Wow, that's a fantastic discussion. Um, I'm intrigued. I haven't read the book yet. I've seen it, and I will buy it, and I'll read it and look forward to it. Um, one of my interests is in, is in how we can change the narratives and rethink, think differently about the Anthropocene and about climate change to reconnect humans and the oceans and nature. And I'm just wondering, I mean, I'm sure this is in the book, but what your take is on this um, in the book in terms of, um, well, thinking perhaps, uh, perhaps about um, the later Peli Haofers, we are the oceans and the oceans are us. Uh, and the Sea of Islands. What, what can you tell us about that kind of changing narrative? Um, well, I'd, so I, I guess what I'd say is that, you know, there's a kind of, there's a kind of glib thing you can say about all life on Earth comes from the oceans. You know, all life on Earth depends on the oceans. But it's one of those statements which is kind of glib at one level, but actually really profound at another level. You know, I mean, in fact, all life does come from the ocean. You know, we share the genetic memory of evolving in the ocean with every other living thing on this planet. You know, and that kind of continuity, I think it's really an important way to think about things. Um, I think also, um, like I said before, that kind of sense that if what you can do is look at the ocean and see how it's facilitated these kind of movements of people and the degree to which it's been a kind of highway for you know, positive things like migration, but also a lot of very negative things, you know, d dispossession, invasion, you know, extraction, all of those kind of things. I think that moves your sense of what the origins of the crisis are slightly, which I think is really important. And I think connects really powerfully the things that Tish was saying about, you know, once you're thinking in a kind of oceanic way, you can see that there are other ways of relating to the planet which are about connection and continuity and reciprocity and things like that. And I do think that something about both thinking, like I'm, you can call it thinking with the ocean, but also just that kind of encounter with those scales of reference actually shifts people's thinking. You know, I mean, there's something about people, you know, people go and stand by the water and they feel different. They feel connected. They feel, you know, and if you can build on that some way, it seems to me to be to be really powerful, I mean, also in a practical sense. So, you know, I was saying beforehand, you know, the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, is one of the big blocks to kind of climate action with shipping. It's been very, very slow to do anything. You know, is talking about bringing in a carbon price. You know, it's actually like, that's a really big deal. You know, and so at a kind of policy level, that's actually a shift in the story. Do you know what I mean? Like, the, you know, the tariffs that are being set up, you know, kind of thinking about how we move goods around and and how that cost is actually one of the ways of kind of shifting that story, you know, just thinking about how we manage fishing and things like that, because as Maria was saying, it's not just about climate. You know, climate's the big one, but, you know, overfishing is a massive, massive issue. You know, in the last 40 years, you know, humans have reduced the number of marine vertebrates by about half. 
Like that's half the fish are gone that were there 40 years ago. You know, and that's from already a massive drop from 200 years before. You know, and so that, kind of getting people to think about that and turn it around would seem to me something that's really important. You wrote, as someone's pointed out in a similar question, so I won't repeat the question, but you know, you write, to understand the ocean is to understand ourselves. And I think that's part of the concept that you, yeah. that um, it shifts both ways. Yeah, I think, I think it alters the way we think about ourselves and the way we think about the world. Yeah. You know? you know, and I mean, and the book starts with that kind of discussion of kind of the Earthrise photo, you know, and that kind of sense that it's a blue planet and everything's connected. Although I would say, People talk about that kind of overview effect, you know, that astronauts went up and they looked back at the planet and they went, look, it's all connected, it's this beautiful thing hanging in space. I would suggest that you could ask any indigenous community in the world and they would tell you exactly the same thing for free, you know, so it's both of... Uh, uh, but I mean, I, there is something significant about that step out and, and looking back and seeing that. Anyone else in the... Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you to all three of you for such an amazing panel, but also just all of the work that you do. James, I just wanted to ask you about something that you said earlier with respect to kind of the way I think that this idea that, you know, 70% of global emissions comes from corporations, a statistic you hear cited a lot, and what you said about kind of implicating corporations rather than, I guess, kind of the rich Western white consumers like myself who kind of drive the demand for... Um, the overconsumption they provide, and if you had any thoughts on whether we've kind of gone too far in putting that blame on corporations at the expense of kind of recognising the role of the consumer, I guess? Mm. I don't think you can blame corporations too much, can you? <laughs> um, uh, uh, oh, look, um, well, what I would say is that the campaign to shift responsibility to, cons you know, I think what I'd probably say is people worry about what they can do as consumers. You know, so, so if you, anyone who works in climate stuff will say, you talk to people and you say, what, do you, what can you do about climate change? And they'll say, well, I can drive an electric car, or I can, you know, recycle my stuff, I can not fly in a plane, you know, and those are all fantastic things to do. But the issues are actually kind of big kind of issues. You know, what we actually need to do is not build Murrup Hub. You know, not, you know, like there's a whole series of things like that we need to get you know, make corporations responsible for the waste and the externalities that they produce and things like that. So, I mean, I just, I do think that there's something about, I guess the way you want to push it back to corporations is for two reasons. One is because it reminds people that, you know, you need to be thinking about what you do as a citizen, not just what you do as a consumer. consumer. But also that, you know, I mean, the reality is we live in a society where the power of business is almost untrammeled, you know, like, I mean, you know, and it's, I mean, uh, look, I agree with you, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to let, you know, consumers off the hook by any means, you know, the patterns of consumption that exist, I mean, they are the issue, but those patterns of consumption have been created by a kind of system of, yeah, I mean, look, and just look at the, look at the changes over the last 10 years, the degree, or the last 20 years, the degrees to which we have seen the quite systematic breakdown of almost all forms of community, the kind of atomization of us, you know, so we sit in our houses staring at our phones, ordering food online, you know, all of those things where people gathered and did things have been broken down. They're all now facilitated by your phone, you know, which is, you know, shifting data and shifting value up to these giant corporations. Like, you know, like, I mean, sorry, I don't want to sound like a crazy ranting person, but, um, but I mean, I do think that that also is a quite specific thing. It's about a kind of transfer to a kind of completely capitalised, completely, you know, kind of atomised kind of society, you know, and, and that kind of quite deliberate assault on all kinds of communality, all kinds of gathering, all kinds of, of that kind of thing. And that's one thing you'd say, like, I'm sure you two would say the same things, but one of the ways you push back in this thing is actually about building connections with people around you, building organisations, learning to, to work with people, spending time with people. Yeah. You know, the amount of time people spend with each other now has massively decreased because they're all sitting there. I mean, I'm just as bad as anyone staring at my phone, you know, rather than talking to the people next to me. And Can I quickly add something? Yeah. I was just thinking as that question is that corporations made, like, made us feel guilty by bringing out their stupid carbon credit <laughs> calculator. 
and they put it on the individual. And so how we make them accountable is, yes, like you said, like we can all change the way we move, do have these incentives, but it's, we need systemic reform. They, corporations are getting away with this because our laws allow them to. And that is, and so a big part our of that. Our subsidies allow yeah. them to as well. So I was trying to say, you're saying it much better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I'm just thinking like where we, right now, uh, there's a lot of work going behind our EPBC Act. Um, and a lot of reform needs to that to strengthen because we have, you know, our government structures, like our climate minister is going really hard about, you know, being progressive, but then our environmental portfolio is the one that's approving the mind. And so we need systemic reform. And for real systemic reform in this country, we need bipartisanship. And so I think that's something where if like you want to talk about how you get um, for, for changes, like go down to your local MP and do something about it. And I think um, the, uh, there's, the, the, there's some dependence on climate fatigue. We've been campaigning for decades now, and we're all kind of exhausted. We, uh, w when we thought we might, would make some, some advance, then the, the, we had this absolute rubbish that we had as a government. for. So we have lost 20 years in our climate action. And the trouble is now, people are saying, just like with the, the fact that the global, that the coral bleaching has not been well covered in the media here, it's almost as if there's an attitude now, well, I can't do anything about it. I'm getting a little bit complacent. Oh, it's bleached again. And I think the real trouble is that since COVID, we're all in our little cubby holes, the collective action has actually suffered. And our politicians are not getting the collective message. They will only listen to a collective message if, they're if it's going to affect their position in parliament. And I think this is where we, we and I totally agree, we do have to um, make sure that we do stay active. I mean, I get exhausted myself. Do I want to write another letter? I don't know if I do or not. And, but I think we just can't let it go. I think, and that's what the corporations would like us to do. Let it go, be exhausted. We can't do anything about it, so move on. And think of our individual, yeah, sort of think of ourselves as individual consumers instead of as communities of people. Yeah. Um, suits them very well. I mean, I think that last week something came out to say that I think it's 80% of the emissions in the last few years came from 70 companies. They're all oil. They're all, they're, it's, it's oil and, and fossil fuels. A lot of them are state owned. It's not people. Like, we consume what they produce, but these are the companies. They have the profits. It's, um, I'll just add one tiny thing. Are there any more questions in the audience? Yes, Great. I've got one here. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I'll, one tiny thing on communities, which is just, I've been researching a story recently on how cities are preparing for climate change, and not only are, com are sort of repairing communities and fostering, like, knowing who your neighbor is and knowing all of that stuff, gonna, not only is it really important to fight, you know, for, like, fight climate change, but when when cities start really suffering, I mean, some already, you know, lots already are, but like knowing who your neighbor is is really gonna help you out. And if you're older, no, you know, you should, you should know your older neighbors so that you can help them out. And all of that stuff, like those are tiny things you can do. And that stuff is gonna really be important and is very important now. Yes. Yeah, just uh, James, a question for you. Uh, like, it's been a bit depressing listening to everything, <laughs> saying, even though it's, uh, it's fantastically interesting. But it seems to me it hasn't really fully connected to the business community yet. And if, if the business community believed what you guys were saying on stage tonight, the stock markets would crash tomorrow. Because the stock markets are valued, the reason they're valued on very low yield is because they're underpinned by sustainable economic growth, which is sustainable. Underneath that lies sustainable population growth. Clearly that's all rubbish. So the assumptions under which our stock markets are valued are completely wrong. And, you, you know, it doesn't take much intelligence to actually put that together. It, it, it seems to be, I, I remember I was in the property industry during the year after 9-11, and you couldn't get terrorism insurance for that year in any city in the world, I think. And eventually governments came in and underpinned the insurance industry. But during that year, you couldn't actually value a commercial building in Sydney. You, there was no, you couldn't sell one, you couldn't buy one it had no value because you couldn't insure it. And it seems to me that that's maybe something that might play out very quickly. I mean, with the bushfires, we've seen it already where swaths of 
the Hunter Valley and mm. different places. You can't insure property anymore, and the floods are the same. Yeah. It could, this could hit the business community really quick, and that's maybe what, where action might come from more quickly, perhaps. Um, yes. I mean, I look, I mean, I think the shift in insurance is really interesting. I mean, you're already getting places that are uninsurable, um, and governments are just going to have to buy people out. I mean, I, I heard Murray Watt when Labor was first elected a couple of years ago talking gamely about, you know, if we can just get higher um, levies and things in place, then maybe we can, you know, if we can change to kind of adaptation around some of those communities, maybe we can make them insurable again, but I'm not sure that that's actually going to work. I, I don't know. I mean, I, look, I, clearly some bits of the business community are engaged, but I mean, you've certainly seen over the last couple of years, I mean, all these companies signed up to various kind of pledges and commitments, lots of them are walking away from them. You know, I mean, I'm talking right, I was writing a letter to my super fund, in fact, on the weekend about the fact that, you know, Woodside's um, board meeting is coming up, they're going to put the board back in, the board is pushing through, you know, the Borough Pub thing, you know, and I mean, my super fund is supposed to, you know, it's got a whole bunch of kind of, you know, highfalutin kind of, you know, environmental statements, you know, and you know, last time it voted with the other institutional investors to put those same directors back. You know, I mean, so it's that thing where, like, you know, like, how do you break into that cycle? And I, I actually, I mean, I actually think the, dis, the, the divestment movement has been very successful at doing that, you know. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's, really, it's really hard. I mean, I think the, but the, the environment movement, I think, has been working really hard on trying to get business to kind of shift some of that stuff, but it's clearly a long game and a hard one. So I'm not going to wrap up on the question of how do you remain optimistic because I'm not sure that anyone will believe that you're particularly optimistic, but someone, which someone asked, but someone has asked whether there's a story or an animal or a memory that any of you kind of return to when times are dark and that you remember of something that changed or just something that you like looking at and that kind of makes you forget things for a while that you think is very amazing. There's a lot of curiosity in your book, James and a lot of kind of looking closely at an animal and just enjoying that and then coming back out and seeing the bigger picture. Um, uh, <laughs> Is that too specific? Would too you like specific? to answer can, can how you remain optimistic? <laughs> well, I, I always look at nature. Uh, and there's still lots of beautiful nature. I was swimming with dolphins last week in Jarvis Bay. I mean, how good is that? So you can never forget that there's some wonderful nature out there to always connect with the sea and there's positives. And that's the very reason why you're in this game in the first place. You want to protect it. So it just is reinforcing something of high value that you want to protect by getting out, even standing at the beach, looking out at the water. This is something that you want to protect. It will encourage you to write your letters to the minister, go to your super fund, divest. Um, so that's the positivity for me. Thank you. I'd probably say like that hope and optimism. It's actually, I will always look and connect to the ocean. That's actually what is like my definitely healing power. I feel I have salt water that pumps in my veins. Um, and I think that's just that deep connection of where I come from. But I think that's what keeps me going. You know, we've got there is just so much that is happening that we have to do, like the decisions we make today for a better tomorrow. Like we cannot, like you just saying, like you're tired from writing letters. My old people are tired too. Like, and it's, bit, it's our inherent responsibility and we cannot leave that for our younger generation. Like that is just bad passing, that's a bad way. Um, and so for me, it's like there's no choice. And so I have to, because this is life or death for me. But I think it's what, you know, keeps me going is people. People power, we've seen it work before. And when we come together, we stand strong. And talking about community, I think it's one thing that Australians are good at. In the face of adversity, we do come together. Whether that's floods, whether that's fires, I, we've actually, Australians all come together and help each other when we really, really need it. And I think this is where, for me, as a proud Kukulug woman, like from the Torres Strait, it's like how climate justice vastly differs to climate action. How 1.5 degrees could mean a fighting chance for my communities, but 2 degrees could mean the end. 
So you wield the weapons that can make us or sell us out. So we have to do this. Keep going. That's awesome. Thank you. I think with that, we'll wrap up on that very strong note. Thank you. And um, so that is the end of tonight's panel. The, James's book will be for sale with Angus from Better Red Than Dead at the back. Um, James will be there to sign books too. Uh, for links to resources and more upcoming talks, visit, visit the Sydney Ideas website, sydney.edu.au forward slash sydney dash ideas. Um, thank you all very much for attending and thank you for your great questions. Um, this has been Sydney Ideas. I'm Helen Sullivan. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Well done. Thank you. Oh my gosh.